Next, the movement that brought preservation to the forefront. Then, a town created around industry. And later, young preservationists unite around saving old buildings. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by American Electric Power is proud to sponsor WOSU Public Media Columbus Neighborhoods. Working together with our communities, we're committed to powering a bright, boundless future for us all. At Ohio Health, we believe it's important to have a healthy understanding of the world around you. That's why we're proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media and their work to educate, entertain, and inspire the people we serve. Bailey Cavalieri, your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated, it just needs to be right. And by viewers like you. Thank you. The Columbus Museum of Art is a perfect example of how a building evolves over time. The original museum on this site was the first museum to register its charter with the state of Ohio. In 1931, this current building replaced the original museum and has seen add-ons, reconstruction, and expansion over time. But it took a lot of people who were passionate about its preservation to keep it going. Columbus has been on the forefront of preserving its historic buildings thanks to individuals like this. And here's how it all started. When we see historic architecture, we might enjoy it, we might appreciate it. What we as preservationists would ask people to think about is the people who built it. Back in the 1850s, there was a, a southern lady who was traveling up the Potomac River and she happened to see George Washington's Mount Vernon house and it was in disrepair by this point and she was so disappointed and shocked by that, that she went back down south and rallied some ladies to save George Washington's home. Because if you, you know, don't save our, our first president's home, really that's just a stain on our country. That was one of the very earliest preservation efforts. The historic preservation movement had focused mainly on national monuments. It was linked very much throughout the 20th century to the preservation of national treasures like the national parks. In the case of Ohio, the homes of our presidents, the very significant earthworks and mounds. In 1963, German Village was recognized as a historic district within the city of Columbus. The German Village Society, the German Village Commission were created and instituted local architectural review. What is remarkable about it is it was a neighborhood of vernacular buildings. It was basically a working class neighborhood. It had the setting with the brick streets and the iron fences and the little yards, but that was not the norm at that time. Normally what communities were preserving were the homes of the rich and famous, their cultural institutions, their major buildings like a courthouse or a state capitol. The preservation effort of the 1960s really emerged as a reaction to urban renewal efforts and transportation and interstate building. There was a lot of damage done to a lot of historic neighborhoods and cities and communities. Vast swaths of American cities were torn down without any thought whatsoever of what was in the way. It really led to the passage of the National Historic Preservation Act. So there were thousands and thousands of buildings that were lost, some significant, some probably not. But there was no way to evaluate what was important, what wasn't important, how do we preserve, how do we move forward without necessarily just wiping out the past. The 1966 National Historic Preservation Act made preservation a national priority and put preservation in the hands of the states. States developed the program in which they would execute the requirements of the federal law. And in Ohio, the natural location for the State Historic Preservation Office was the Ohio Historical Society. Their main thrust was to 
get out there and identify the historic sites, survey historic properties, list historic properties and sites in the National Register of Historic Places. So it gave local people more control. It gave local officials a way to evaluate what was significant. And it really put the focus on what happens at the local level with these tools at the national level. But the fact is, preservation is local. One of the great losses in the city of Columbus to this day is Union Station. The fact that that building was torn down in 1976, designed by Daniel Burnham, one of the most important architects in American history. Not only did we lose a piece of our history, we actually lost federal funding. And that's a part of the story people don't necessarily know about. The city was applying for money for transportation, for a transportation center at this new convention center. They tore down Union Station, didn't go through the appropriate review process to say, is this a historic building? How can we save it? How could we incorporate it in the design? And they were disqualified for funding, which became a national case. There were editorials in cities well outside of Ohio saying, learn from Columbus, Ohio. We need to respect our historic properties as we move forward in the future. What happened out of Union Station? A couple of things. One is the Columbus Landmarks Foundation was formed and became an advocate for historic preservation in the city. In 1976, that same year, Congress passed the Tax Reform Act that provided some tax incentives, not the incentives that we have available today, but it was the first time there were tax incentives for the rehabilitation of historic properties. And it saved the second Daniel Burnham building in Columbus, the Wyandotte Building. That law had a direct impact on the preservation of that building. I have no doubt People believe that listing a property in the National Register means that that property will never be able to be demolished. And that's just not the case. The National Register listing tells a property owner, tells others that you have a property that is worthy of preservation because of its significance in history and architecture and our culture. You know, one thing that we preservationists don't do is we don't preserve everything just for the sake of preservation. We want to make good decisions. We realize that there needs to be a balance between infrastructure improvement, development, public works, and what we try to help do is to find a balance. So we play a role in helping federal agencies and communities make good decisions and what they should preserve. It's really about property owners or neighborhood associations deciding to band together and say, this is important to us. The longer you can keep saving things and fighting for them and preserving them, the better off you are. I think it reflects that when you drive through German Village in Old Town and King Lincoln and Victorian Village. There's really an active preservation movement in Columbus. And what I'm happiest about, it's engaging young professionals, architects, planners, people who want to live in a city that's interesting and dynamic and diverse. I won't be around to watch the next 50 years, but I'm really hoping that the young generation pick up the mantle and they make it theirs and they do it their way. And I'm sure it will be for the good of everybody. Next, how the fall of industry impacted an East Columbus neighborhood. And then, the creative efforts of young preservationists. Throughout history, neighborhoods have developed around iconic buildings like the Columbus Museum of Art. But sometimes, it's industry that draws people to an area and builds communities. And the livelihood of both components working together are vital. So what happens to those neighborhoods when industry fails? Well, one East Columbus neighborhood has experienced that unfortunate scenario. And here's their story. There's something kind of interesting about walking on old railroad tracks. You're looking at the wooden ties and just imagining what the hustle and bustle must have been like around here. The Rarick Company starts on this site probably by about the late 1860s. Yes. And they're making the gun carriages for uh, heavy weapons that are going to be used in the Spanish-American War. And a gentleman uh, named Ralston came down here from Toronto and bought the Rarig Engineering Company and started the Ralston Steel Car Company. 
and erected this building behind us in um, 1910, 1915. They invented the coal hopper. A hopper car is a car built in two V's and they opened the bottom up and the coal fell into the coal truck. They also built gondolas and box cars. The factory run from Cassidy Avenue east all the way to James Road. You think of the Levesque Tower as being a little over 555 feet and this is 1,900 feet, perhaps a little more. This is like three, almost four Levesque Towers, side to side. The railroad industry was jumping and jiving. They just couldn't build enough cars for Pennsylvania, New York Central, B&O, C&O. They were all giving them orders. They started the steel on this end and about 500 feet in and there were large bridge cranes inside that would take them down until they could get them on tracks. There were three tracks in each gable, pretty much made by hand and they were doing like 19 a day. Ralston made uh, as many as 10,000 cars in a relatively short period of time. I'm sure they did. What's interesting is the Ralston is kind of starting up about just after the turn of the century, but before World War I. Right. And so Columbus at that point is actually getting immigrants in. There is the long-standing German and Irish community, but they're getting in uh, immigrants from Eastern Europe, from Central Europe. Right. So there's Hungarians and Poles and Czechs and Slavs and Slovenians and Slovakians. Right. And at the same time, it's the great migration from the South, so African-Americans, and they're correct. all looking for work. This was quite a bustling industrial community. Company houses, company infirmary, okay. their own power plant. A company town is really where the predominance of one, uh, usually manufacturing institution, controls everything. A lot of houses on 4th Avenue were owned by Ralston. From early photographs, we know that Ralston built a variety of different kinds of houses. Uh, some were small and cottages, some were two-story. Uh, generally, they were always framed, and most of them actually were defined by the street by little picket fences. We lived in a company house. Everybody had an outhouse. We didn't have any electric. We had gas lights, and that's the way we lived in a company house. When my father was laid off from the railroad, he was off to work for about three years. He bought the house from Ralston for $1,500, and they deducted the monthly payment from his pay. When he was laid off, they never evicted anybody. And then when they got rehired at Ralston, they went ahead and let them pick up their payments right where they left off. They didn't have them pay all the back dues. Nobody was evicted. Try that today. As immigrant families settle into their new East Columbus life, many people move away from the factory work and create small businesses, such as the Tartle family, who had immigrated from Czechoslovakia, and the Liska family, who came from Poland. Sometime in 1937, Dad opened a grocery store. It was called the East Columbus Market. And it was in a storefront on half of the building. They opened a bar on one side of the building, kept the grocery on the other. And after a couple weeks, the bar made more money than the grocery store. That was the end of the grocery. <laughs> it opened, I'm assuming, around 1935. It first shows up in the city directory in 1936. And it was called uh, North Bexley View Inn. My dad purchased it from my mother and my aunt and renamed it in 1950 to the Bar and Grill. And as a kid, you know, we always came here and worked on Sundays, cleaning up, you know. Then to get out of that job, I had to go to University of Detroit, so I didn't have to work here. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I graduated there in 1970, and then I started full-time here, and that's when my education started. <laughs> when you work behind a bar, you really get the education. When Eisenhower became president, all the emphasis was put on the interstate highways. And what happened? The trucking industry hollered hurrah, but the railroad industry went downhill and Ralston Steel Car Company closed up. The last order Ralston Steel Car Company got 
was an order for funeral cars to bring back bodies from World War II from Europe. And my father was one of the last four people to leave that factory. People started to move to Gehanna. They moved out in the outskirts. That's when we all got married and yeah, everybody it was, left. It was time for us to move on. I believe it is, in a situation it is today, possibly because of 670 kind of divided the community, and then renters. I don't think many of the people that live around here own their own house, so they don't take care of it. Sometimes they have to be told to cut the grass. It's a lot of unemployment now, and welfare is a big part of it. I mean, a lot of people out here are on government assistance, drugs, a big part. I mean, when you leave here, you'll meet somebody on the corner begging for money. You know, they come in and want something to drink or eat. As far as what I would like to see, I can't say that I, it'll ever happen in my lifetime. Uh, there's just too much apathy. Uh, I also belong to the Civic Association, and we have try to have regular meetings, but, you know, that's hard. When we do have a meeting out of 4,000 people in this community, we get five or six people show up for a meeting. So, and it's the same story with any organization. How do you get people involved? I would think that the city would be more interested in developing Fifth Avenue because of, you want to say, the gateway to 670, which is, you know, the airport. I mean, we had a couple people come here a year ago, and they Googled it on their phone and found this place because they didn't want to eat the airport. And the needs today, of course, you know, the Schottenstein Corporation developed the Air Center and uh, DSW is down there and, and there's some uh, government offices. There are over 500 uh, people employed by the companies uh, in our park. So there's a lot of traffic. There are a lot of people work in this area. What we looked at as uh, members of the Business and Civic Associations here were, well, what about if we had restaurants where they could eat, you know, on the way in or, or at lunch? Does eat. Yeah, 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 that's that's right. You got to eat lunch. Columbus is, does a great job of uh, development planning, uh, developing uh, certain neighborhoods, and we have a plan. There's been a plan and a study over several years uh, that Cassidy will be widened and uh, roundabouts put in and it goes on north and in time. We'll be a support area for, for Easton, Bexley. Well, we hope those restaurants, especially with those Polish and Hungarian cabbage rolls, oh, make their appearance very soon. And uh, uh, old industrial sites are so attractive to people, so uh, don't overlook the possibility of a restaurant right here. That's right. <laughs>It's a lot of work to save a structure that's on the endangered building list, and it takes a lot of specialized knowledge. On this edition of Driving with Darby, Jeff is catching up with the Young Ohio Preservationists, a group that is devoted to teaching the next generation about preservation. We're on East Long Street on the east side of the city, and the Columbus Landmarks Foundation, which was established in 1977 to promote historic preservation, but also good new design, recently established the endangered buildings list. The idea of the endangered buildings list is to make people aware of properties in the city uh, that, that are worthy of preservation, but they're in danger of being lost. Now we're headed up uh, Taylor to Mount Vernon, still on the east side of the city, to see another building that is currently on the endangered buildings list. And we're going to also uh, meet with some members of the Young Ohio Preservationists, um, an interesting group recently formed that's helping to promote historic preservation here in Columbus. Well, it's one of those Ohio days. I'm glad I brought my umbrella. Hi, how are you, Amanda? Hey, Jeff, good, good, to, see you. You. good to see you. Good to see you. Hello, Sarah, good to see you. Good to see you. So preservationists do come out in the rain. We do, come out in all weather. So we're here on the east side at Taylor and Mount Vernon with one of the endangered buildings on the landmarks and uh, endangered building list. Tell me something about the area. We're seeing some investment in this neighborhood, aren't we? We are, we're actually seeing a significant amount of investment. Many of the vacant homes have been purchased and redone and they're being sold. And a lot of the vacant lots are actually starting to be infilled as well. With new construction. With like new, new construction. New single family houses. Yeah, new single family houses. That's really good news. It is. And then now you two are both members of Young Ohio Preservationists, a yeah. nonprofit organization. 
And how big is the group? We're a subgroup of Heritage Ohio, and we have a board of about 10 people, but we have over 300 people on our mailing list who like to engage in unconventional preservation activity. Oh, that's great. Uh, what sort of things does YOP do? We actually spent some time at this Mount Vernon Taylor building decorating in comments of love and encouragement of revitalization. We like to infuse unconventional act of urbanism, so maybe a hike through a downtown instead of a conventional walking tour, maybe bikes. We like to try and reach a broader audience than the typical history buff. Well, tell us a little more about this building. Mount Vernon Taylor is currently owned by the Pact Group of Columbus. That's People Achieving Community Transformation. It's a community group that seeks to revitalize the east side of Columbus. And they have been hosting community meetings over the past year to determine what to do with this beautiful historic building. This has been historically a commercial building. It's been art galleries, barber shops, and everything in between. But they haven't found the right contemporary use. And uh, you know, it's a large building, over three stories. I assume it would house multiple functions. Yes. Uh, some community space, perhaps some business space, office space, possibly business incubator space. Are, are those the kinds of ideas they're talking about? Those are some ideas, and you can even see that local high school students have turned it into an art space already. They really have. This was an initiative for, what is it, these high school kids came yes. over? That's great. Well, you know, there are a lot of features of this building that are sort of nice architectural features. Let's, let's have a look at it, maybe some of the neighborhood as well. The, well, the entrance, for example, that really nice stone trim around the entrance. And we don't know whether there might be historic doors behind there, but boy, the, the stone archway is really nice with a little curly hue detail at the end. And the detail up at the roof. Right, it's sort of repeated up there in the sheet metal right. cornice. Yeah, yeah, and those big arch windows. Right. Boy, it is a wonderful building. I wonder if there's sort of a big open space on the upper floor. We don't know what the interior is like. It's been buttoned up for so long. You can see remnants of the old storefront, the wood framing. There would have originally been large windows there, so you could see the commercial Right, goods. and this would have been a nice corner entrance, again, with the stone. I think it's also important to note that this is actually the gateway into the neighborhood. It really is. So you're coming off 670, off of the Leonard exit. And this right. is the gateway. And actually, right. another young preservationist owns this set of buildings. Oh, really? all the way to the end there. And there was a commercial building on this parcel that uh, the city condemned, and so she actually demolished it, and she's gonna put a mural there and create a well, park. Help. So Sarah, how do you become involved with Young Ohio Preservationists, YOP? Reach out to us on social media and become a Yelper. You can reach out through Facebook or Instagram, and we regularly update the accounts with events that we have. We have all ages. We've had infants to people in their 80s attend our events. I think that's great. Well, thanks so much. It's, uh, it's good to see this building, to see what YOP is up to. A lot of people would look at something like this and say, oh God, it's so far gone, there's nothing we could do about it. Uh, preservationists tend to look at it and say, this isn't so bad, this can be right. fixed up. And the fact is, it can be done. If you're, if you're skillful, if you do good design, if you're careful in how you design it and build it, you can do it at a reasonable cost. That's why these well-built older buildings, they can take a lot of abuse over time and still be capable of economical rehabilitation. Curious CBUS is WOSU's project where you submit your questions about our region, its people, or its history, and we assign a reporter or producer to investigate it. Today's question comes from a viewer who asks, where can I find information about the cottages on High Street in the Beechwald area? Since Beechwald is just north of Clintonville, we thought we'd turn to their historical society for this answer. There are two kind of English country stone cottages that sit next to each other on High Street. Those were built in 1936 by Earl Kotkins for his daughter, Mildred. Earl was a building contractor, so he's built a number of houses around Clintonville. But one interesting thing is that he built these cottages at Mildred's insistence. And the intention was to set a tone for what was the developing beach walled neighborhood. So prior to this, there would have been a lot of farm houses. So Earl and his daughter decided that they wanted to kind of lead with this English country theme. So they built these right along High Street. First the house was built and then a doctor's office. So Mildred married John Paul Urban, who was a doctor, a physician. And so they had their house sitting right next to their doctor's office. Ultimately, Mildred 
and John divorce. But Mildred stays on at the cottages. She maintains them uh, really up until her death. And at her death, she donates them to Ohio State University uh, to be used for visiting professors. The university holds them for a while and then ultimately decides that it's in their best interest to sell the cottages. So interestingly, they sell the cottages to a gentleman who is a doctor, he's a podiatrist, and he runs a business called Urban Podiatry. Do you have a question for Curious CBUS? Head to WOSU.org slash curious to submit your idea, vote on which question we should investigate next, and see what we've covered so far. Thanks for being with us. And remember, you can catch all our episodes on ColumbusNeighborhoods.org. Plus, see our stories on the WOSU mobile app. And you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by American Electric Power is proud to sponsor WOSU Public Media Columbus Neighborhoods. Working together with our communities, we're committed to powering a bright, boundless future for us all. At Ohio Health, we believe it's important to have a healthy understanding of the world around you. That's why we're proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media and their work to educate, entertain and inspire the people we serve. Bailey Cavalieri, your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated, it just needs to be right. And by viewers like you. Thank you.